Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the evolution of hemoglobin through the duplication and specialization of its genes, and much, much more. So let's jump right in. Going through our ancestry in the previous episodes, we've joined mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, lungfish, coelacanths, and the ray finfish. Collectively, these fall under the clade Osteichthys, the bony fish. Now, at 39 episodes in, we're going to meet up with the remaining living vertebrate relatives, the cartilaginous fish and the few remaining jawless fish, as well as many of the interesting extinct relatives. There is a lot to cover. We will start with the group that is more closely related to us. The clade that includes the cartilaginous fish is called chondrichthys. Even though they are called cartilaginous fish, it's not actually an identifiable trait unique to this group. Having a cartilaginous skeleton is more ancient. The jawless vertebrates, which we shall meet later, also have cartilaginous skeletons. Ironically, one unique trait of these groups is the way their cartilage is calcified. You are perhaps familiar with the cartilage that's inside your nose and ears. These are soft and flexible because they are unmineralized. However, the skeleton of cartilaginous fish isn't like that. They have what is called prismatic calcified cartilage, wherein the surface of their cartilage is calcified as little tesserae plates arranged in a neat mosaic pattern. This surface mineralization makes their cartilage tough but it is still different from the endochondral bone in Osteichthys, like us, which first start out as a cartilage precursor that later gets completely replaced by bone. Another notable trait unique to chondrichthys are a pair of claspers, which are used for internal fertilization. The parent clade uniting chondrichthys with Osteichthys is nathostomata, the jawed vertebrates. Our common ancestor with the chondrichthyans lived about 460 million years ago in the Middle Ordovician period. This was a time of great climatic change. While the early Ordovician was very hot, as the period went on, Earth got progressively cooler, culminating in the late Ordovician glaciation. During this time, the supercontinent of Gondwana was located at the South Pole, onto which massive ice sheets rapidly expanded. Volcanoes depositing massive amounts of silicate rocks, drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, is suspected to have been the cause. As less carbon dioxide remained in the atmosphere, the planet cooled. This change in Earth's climate resulted in the extinction of about 85% of all marine species. This was the late Ordovician mass extinction, the first of the Big Five extinctions in Earth's history. It dealt a major blow to many ancient groups of organisms, most notably the trilobites, which lingered on until the end Permian. We will cover the trilobites in a later episode. After this event, the diversity of fish went wild, hence why it's often referred to as the Age of Fish. But what about the diversity of chondrichthys? This class is split into two suborders, holocephali and elasmobranchii. Holocephali are more commonly referred to as chimeras, ratfish, or ghost sharks. The name holocephali means complete head, which refers to the way their upper jaws are completely fused to their cranium. Today, chimeras are mostly found in the deep sea, where they feed on benthic invertebrates with their specialized tooth plates. There are three families of chimera, Calorhynchidae, Rhinochimeridae, and Chimeridae. Calorhynchidae has an elongated, flexible snout, Rhinochimeridae has a long, pointed snout, and Chimeridae has a short, rounded snout. Chimeras look a bit like sharks, but with a long, tapering tail, instead of the normal shark heterocircle tail. They propel themselves by flapping their large pectoral fins instead of stroking their tail. They also have a dorsal spine which is sometimes venomous. Such dorsal spines at the leading edge of the dorsal fins is a feature that appears to be ancestral in chondrichthians, since ancient and some modern sharks, like the Port Jackson shark and the spur dog, have them also. 
Stingrays apparently lost this structure while their venomous tail spine is a modified scale. A little over 50 species of chimeras are still with us, but despite their overall similar body shape today, extinct chimeras came in a huge variety of forms. Especially after the end Devonian mass extinction, these occupied various niches during the Carboniferous and Permian. First appearing in the early Devonian period, chimeras evolved body shapes from the more shark-like forms. One of these are the Simoriaforms, like Stethacanthus and Falcatus, with their brush-like dorsal fin. These were so shark-like that they were once thought to have been more closely related to the shark and ray group. However, more recent studies put them slightly closer to the chimeras. You may have noticed that Falcatus had this weird head spine. This appears to be a case of sexual dimorphism, since these spines are only found on specimens with features indicating claspers. Similar cases of sexual dimorphism appear to have been prevalent among different and separate groups of chimeras. These include Echinochimera, the stingray-like Squaloraja, which had a single forward-facing horn, and the bizarre tadpole-like Delphiodontos. Then there was also the eel-shaped Harpagofutuder that sported a pair of cartilaginous horns. The most famous extinct chimera, often mistaken for a shark, was Helicoprion with its saw-like lower jaw, guaranteed to provoke a startled double-take by anyone seeing it for the first time. It's thought that this specialized tooth arrangement was used to extract cephalopods, like ammonites, out of their shells. Aside from shark-like or eel-like chimeras, there was also the patalodontiformes, such as balancia, which appeared to have teeth specialized to graze upon very hard encrusted organisms, similar to parrotfish. Sadly, many of these unique forms were wiped out by the Permian-Triassic extinction, which we covered in the Lava Lizard's Tale. Aside from the chimeras, the other suborder of chondrichthians, elasmobranchii, is the sharks and stingrays. Elasmobranchs share the trait of serial tooth replacement where new teeth continuously grow behind the older ones. Even rays with their flattened teeth do this. Instead of a swim bladder, they predominantly use a large fatty liver that provides buoyancy. They also have highly mobile skulls because the jaws remain loosely suspended unlike those in chimeras, which are highly fused to the skull. The details of jaw articulation to the skull are different in different groups of sharks and rays. We met stingrays in the previous tale, so let's meet the sharks. Most sharks are highly streamlined predators with razor-sharp teeth, such as the great white shark, bull shark, and gray reef shark. Other sharks have teeth more for crushing hard-shelled prey, like the zebra shark or the horn shark. There are also elongated eel-shaped sharks like the frilled shark. But the largest extant sharks, the whale shark, basking shark, and megamouth shark, are peaceful planktivores. One of the largest known sharks was the definitely extinct Otodus megalodon, commonly known as just the megalodon, that lived from 23 to 2 million years ago. Adult megalodon predominantly preyed on small baleen whales, so if it were still around, we'd definitely notice. Unfortunately, many sharks and rays may soon share the megalodon's fate. Over one-third of all chondrichthians are endangered or threatened. The last common ancestor between modern elasmobranchs, the sharks and rays, lived during the Triassic between 200 and 250 million years ago. However, as always, there were several lineages that are outside this crown group that are now completely extinct. There were the Tenacanthiforms that lived from the late Devonian until the end Permian, some of which reached sizes comparable to the great white shark. The Xenacanthiforms were elongated forms with a dorsal fin that ran continuously along the length of their body. These first appeared in the Carboniferous, most were wiped out during the end Permian extinction event, with a few surviving until the end Triassic. The last extinct elasmobranch group to mention are hybodontiforms, ranging from the late Devonian to the end Cretaceous. They were very ecologically diverse, ranging from large-sized macropredators to ones that had blunt, rounded teeth to consume hard-shelled prey. They were also prevalent in both marine and freshwater environments. However, during the Mesozoic, modern sharks were slowly taking over the marine ecology, while the hybodonts lingered on mainly in freshwater, 
until they went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. While chondrichthyes are mostly unossified, one structure that is highly ossified is obviously their teeth. While teeth are forming, cells called odontoblasts secrete dentine, which is mostly composed of hydroxyapatite and organic material. Atop the dentine is enamel, which is 96% hydroxyapatite, that is secreted by cells called ameloblasts. Once a tooth has fully developed, it erupts from the gums. As humans, which I definitely am also, we only get two sets of teeth, a baby set and an adult set. This is called the diphyodont condition, shared by all mammals. By contrast, most other vertebrates, along with, oddly, manatees, elephants, and kangaroos, are polyphyodont, meaning they continually replace their teeth. Technically, they are cheating. They have a finite number of molars, like us, but these erupt at the back of the jaw and move forward like a conveyor belt as they erode. Elephants only have six sets of replacement teeth. But in crocodilians and toothed fish, the new tooth starts out underneath the current tooth and eventually pushes out the old one. Sharks may go through up to 30,000 teeth in their lifetime. Structurally related to teeth are the dermal denticles, the external scales of sharks and stingrays, which make their skin feel like rough sandpaper. Different from reptile scales, cartilaginous fish dermal denticles are derived from the neural crest, while reptile scales arise from the epidermis. And just like a tooth, dermal denticles have a pulp with blood vessels, which is surrounded by dentine and then topped with enamel. As for the scales of bony fish, these largely arise from the mesodermal layer of the dermis and are composed of lightly mineralized acellular bone and or lamellar bone-like tissues. They come in a variety of types, including ganoid, cycloid, and tenoid. Cycloid scales have concentric ring structures, while tenoid scales have comb-like structures at the edges. Ganoid scales have a unique layer of dentine and ganoine that are found in Bashirs, Gars, and Coelacanths. Darwin referenced these fish in Origin of Species, pointing out that they represent a link between taxa of animals now widely separated and coining the term living fossil in the following sentence to characterize them. As for their scales, evidently, jawless vertebrates had ones partially composed of both dentine, like cartilaginous fish, and acellular bone, like bony fish. The proportion made of acellular bone was reduced in cartilaginous fish, while the proportion made of dentine was reduced in bony fish. The type of scale found in early jawless vertebrates is cosmoid, which is great for protection, but not great for rapid movement. Nathostomes progressively made their scales more lightweight and flexible over evolutionary history, enhancing speed and maneuverability. Given the structural and developmental similarities between teeth and scales, the question arises, how did teeth and scales originate? While teeth only exist in jawed vertebrates, denticle scales can be traced back to jawless ones. Both teeth and scales are part of the dermal exoskeleton, while most bones inside of us that form from the ossification of cartilage are the endoskeleton. More on that later. To further complicate matters, what about the teeth of lampreys? These are not actually teeth like what is in the mouth of all nathostomes. Instead, these are more like keratin horns that are replaced from underneath in the course of the individual's life, stacking like traffic cones as the top layer is slowly worn away. Additionally, conodonts and jawless vertebrates called thelodonts also independently evolved tooth-like structures that aren't structurally or developmentally homologous to nathostome teeth. And the jawless vertebrate clades Galeaspida and Osteostraci had pharyngeal denticles, but these aren't homologous to teeth either. One well-known hypothesis for the origin of teeth involved dermal denticles invading first the tissue surrounding the mouth before moving into the mouth. This is called the outside-in hypothesis. Competing with this idea is the inside-out hypothesis, where teeth were a de novo independent structure. Given the developmental homologies between teeth and scales, the fact that scales precede nathostome teeth evolutionarily, 
and that the tooth-like structures of conodonts, thelodonts, galeaspids, and osteostracans aren't homologous with nathostome teeth, the evidence weighs strongly in favor of the outside-in hypothesis. With teeth down, that brings us to the origin of the vertebrate jaw. Where did it come from? This gets a bit complicated. We need to cover some vertebrate anatomy to fully unpack this. Bony vertebrates like us make two types of bone. The aforementioned endochondral bone that forms from a cartilage precursor, and dermal bone that ossifies directly within the dermis without a cartilage precursor. We can describe the former as the internal endoskeleton, and the latter, the exoskeleton. In us, most of the skeleton below the head is endoskeleton, with the exception of the kneecaps and portions of the clavicle and shoulder blades. However, most bones in our head are part of the exoskeleton, including the jaw bones. The parts of the head that are endoskeletal can be divided further into two types, the endocranium and the spalanchnocranium. The endocranium in us includes the base of the skull that surrounds the foramen magnum and a part of the temporal bones that house the inner ears. Cartilaginous fish like sharks also have the endocranium, more often called the chondrocranium, but in them it remains unossified and it comprises the entire skull. Aside from the denticles, cartilaginous fish don't have exoskeletal bones. What this implies is that only a portion of our skull is homologous to the skulls of sharks, but we ossified it, and we have accessory bones that originated from the exoskeleton. Indeed, as we shall see in other extinct fish, this is the case. Now let's swing to the spalanchnocranium, which consists of structures that are derived from the pharyngeal arches. Developmentally, the vertebrate jaw arises from the first pharyngeal arch, but many other structures also arise from these arches, such as the inner ear bones of mammals, the incus, malleus, and stapes. We have seen in our synapsid ancestors that the incus and malleus were still jaw bones, the quadrate and articular, while the stapes used to be the only inner ear bone, also called the columella. We can still see this configuration in reptiles and amphibians. More recently, we also observe that even the stapes was originally a jaw-associated structure as well the hyomandibula, in our fishy relatives. As we discussed in the lava lizard's tail, since all these have been modified to become inner ear bones, mammals only have one lower jawbone, the dentary, so-called on account of it bearing teeth. Other notable pieces of the spalanchnocranium are the hyoid, the styloid process, and various unossified cartilages like those in the thyroid and Meckel's cartilage in our lower jaw. The latter is not the precursor to the aforementioned dentary. The dentary is one of those dermal or exoskeletal bones that has no cartilage precursor. In us, Meckel's cartilage is the remnant of the structure that originally comprised most of the lower jaw in early jawed vertebrates, which is still the case in modern cartilaginous fish. But in bony fish, Meckel's cartilage was predominantly superseded by the dentary. While it is not so obvious that dermal bones like the dentary are part of an exoskeleton in us, we can see a much clearer division between the exoskeleton and endoskeleton in a group of fish that we haven't covered yet. The placoderms. They are a paraphyletic assemblage of stem nathostomes with jaws, dermal bony armor plates, the exoskeleton, mainly around the head, and a mostly unossified cartilaginous endoskeleton. Because of this, most placoderm fossils only preserve the bony exoskeletal head shield. They are interesting for many different reasons. Some of these are the oldest known organisms to have evolved internal fertilization and giving birth to live young, independently of those seen in modern jawed vertebrates. They first appeared in the early Silurian about 439 million years ago and were the dominant vertebrate group in the Devonian period. But sadly, the last of them perished at the end of Onian extinction event 359 million years ago. Among the placoderms, we find a series of lineages that are progressively less closely related to the living nathostomes, and thus sharing fewer traits with us, going from Janusiscus to Entelognathus to Quilinu to the clades Arthrodira, Patelictheida, and Antiarcha. 
The placoderms most closely related to us also have some of the same exoskeletal bones that were incorporated into the jaws, like the dentary, and also the maxilla and premaxilla that constitute the upper jaw, although these did not have any teeth in them yet. A dentary with teeth is a trait that evolved in the lineage leading to the bony fish. These transitional placoderm species were described fairly recently, within the last 11 years. The fact that they possessed the same jaw bones as us prompted paleontologists to change their views on jawed vertebrate phylogeny. Placoderms were previously thought to be a monophyletic group, distinct from the living jawed vertebrates. But now we think the placoderms were paraphyletic. Modern jawed vertebrates actually descended from them. But this also has another surprising implication. If we and other Osteichthians inherited dermal jawbones from placoderms, that must mean the ancestors of chondrichthians also possess these dermal bones, but they also must have completely lost these and all other dermal bones at some point. There are more extinct fish groups that corroborate this. The acanthodians, also called spiny sharks, were once thought to be closely related to the bony fish, but more recent studies put them just closer to the cartilaginous fish and many acanthodians did have dermal bones. More recently, in 2022, there was the description of the oldest currently known relative of the cartilaginous fish named Shinacanthus, dating back to the early Silurian 436 million years ago. As the paper reads, quote, The chondrichthian Shinacanthus ver vermiformis exhibits extensive thoracic armor plates that were previously unknown in this lineage and include a large median dorsal plate, as in placoderms combined with a conventional chondrichthian bow plan, close quote. Just another transitional fossil to add to an already extensive list. While more distantly related placoderms did not share the same dermal jaw bones with us, like the dentary, they still possess many bony plates around the face, and many placoderm lineages have incorporated these into their jaws independently. A very good example of this can be seen in the placoderm lineage called Arthrodira. The name means jointed neck, which refers to their bony plates having mobile joints between the neck and head. During their evolution, their Meckel's cartilage was also superseded by a dermal bone, but a different one called the infragnathal, which did not have any teeth. Instead, the bone itself had a shearing edge, which formed an enormous self-sharpening blade in the most famous of all placoderm genera, Dunkleosteus. The dermal bones of its jaw and skull and the hinges between them formed a four-bar linkage mechanism which enabled Dunkleosteus to open and close its jaws at blinding speeds, which created suction to draw prey inward, while also producing some of the highest bite forces the Earth has ever seen. As we mentioned in the leafy sea dragon's tail, many crown nathostomes, placoderms, and jawless vertebrates evolved in shallow marine environments. This may have been due to the constraints placed on them by their morphology, as early stem nathostomes were not very streamlined, while also having to carry a heavy skeleton. Another reason for their nearshore origin might have been to avoid competition with contemporary invertebrates, such as cephalopods, which, like vertebrates, also originated during the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. Support for this comes from the fact that more heavily armored stem nathostomes moved further inshore still, while less armored, more graceful forms moved towards the open ocean. And evolving in a nearshore marine environment explains why nathostomes repeatedly colonized freshwater ecosystems. Returning to the evolution of the jaw, this also explains the existence of that respiratory opening just behind the eye in chondrichthians and some osteichthians, the spiracles. This requires a bit of explanation. Gills are openings in the esophagus that water passes through to deliver oxygen to the animal's bloodstream. Oxygen diffuses from water to the bloodstream, moving in the opposite direction because the oxygen content of the blood is lower and this process is called countercurrent exchange. Your kidneys use the same process to remove water from urine. Now, in non-tetrapod nathostomes and lancelets, the gills are slits. However, in lampreys, hagfish, and hemichordates, the slits are reduced to just a series of holes. 
The first gill opening was separated from the others by the formation of the jaw, becoming the spiracles. Chondrichthians mostly still have spiracles, although a few lineages, such as the Requiem sharks, hammerhead sharks, and chimeras, have lost it. Among ray finned fish, bashirs and rope fish still use their spiracles to breathe, raising their spiracles to the water's surface without taking their whole head out of water. But the spiracles are vestigial in sturgeons and paddlefish. All more derived ray finned fish lack spiracles, and neither coelacanths nor lungfish have functional spiracles. Intriguingly, bashirs participate in spiracle breathing when in shallow water which raises some interesting possibilities for stem tetrapods. Gogonasus, Tiktaalik, and Ventastega have large spiracles consistent with using them to breathe, but a major difference between these species and Bashirs is that stem tetrapods have their eyes positioned on top of their head. This would allow them to take in atmospheric oxygen while sitting at the water's surface, pursuing prey like a crocodile. The breathing function of spiracles was later lost among crown tetrapods, and they took on a new function. Hearing. Remember that fish have a skull bone called the hyomandibula, but in tetrapods this bone became detached from the rest of the skull. In amphibians and sauropsids we call the hyomandibula the columella, and in mammals we call it the stapes. The spiracle is also referred to under a different name in crown tetrapods. It's called the Odic notch, or, in our case, the inner ear. Note the spiracle is connected to the esophagus. Well, our inner ear also connects to the esophagus via the eustachian tube. And much like how the jaw bones were exapted into ear bones for better sound conduction, the same thing is true of the spiracle. According to a 2022 paper, quote, it seems probable that the spiracular tract combined a retained air breathing function with an aquatic auditory function based on sound waves being picked up by the density contrast between body tissues and the enclosed air space, similar to the use of the swim bladder and Weberian ossicles in Ostariophysian teleosts. Close quote. Atop this spiracle, frogs, sauropsids, and mammals then independently evolve the tympanic membrane or eardrum. Closely associated with the spiracle is another structure important in hearing, the inner ear itself. However, in jawed fish like sharks, the part dedicated to hearing is not as well developed as it is in tetrapods, but they do have the vestibular organ with three semicircular canals that function for the sense of balance and orientation. Next, we're pulling a bit further out from the jawed stemnathostomes to the jawless ones. Extinct jawless fish groups are often collectively called ostracoderms, but that is yet another paraphyletic assemblage. These include Osteostraci, Giliaspida, Pteriaspida, Thelodonti, Heterostraci, Astraspida, and Arandaspida. Just like the placoderms, these jawless vertebrates still sport tough dermal armor. They also have pectoral and dorsal fins, but unlike most nathostomes around today, they lack pelvic fins, and they only have two semicircular canals in their inner ear. One transition that took place early in the jawless nathostomes was the consolidation of multiple cartilaginous plates into a single unit we now call the neurocranium. The basally derived jawless vertebrate Eryptychius from the Middle Ordovician, 458 to 453 million years ago, has this series of cartilages but more derived vertebrates have just the single neurocranium. Fascinatingly, cyclostomes, the lampreys and hagfish, don't have either of these conditions. Instead, they have a series of paired and midline cartilages in the head. The condition of Eryptychius seems to be a transitional step between the earlier separate paired cartilages and the later fused neurocranium. Now we've arrived at the early Ordovician, during which a series of major evolutionary radiations were occurring. Collectively, these radiations are called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, or GOBI. And during this event, stromatoporoid sponges, corals, brachiopods, mollusks, echinoderms, trilobites, and bryozoans diversified extensively. 
Gobi saw a tripling of marine family diversity and the establishment of the so-called Paleozoic fauna that characterized the rest of the era's oceans. Gobi was further a transition from the ecologically generalist fauna of the Cambrian to the specialized Paleozoic fauna. The reasons for Gobi have been debated, but one explanation is that the diversification of Cambrian fauna made Gobi inevitable. In essence, the Cambrian was dominated by sessile, benthic filter-feeding animals that were adapted for conditions that were not nutrient-limited. Their diversification in the Cambrian led eventually to conditions where nutrients became progressively less abundant, giving rise to communities of dominantly active filtering Paleozoic fauna. Indeed, there seems to be a continuous lead-up to Gobi from the Cambrian. And before we reach the extant cyclostomes, we need to make contact with one last clade of jawless vertebrates, the conodonts. The affinities of conodonts have been long debated since their first description in 1856. However, soft tissue impressions in South Africa in the 1990s finally gave researchers vital clues to their phylogenetic placement. Conodonts have been argued as either stemnathostomes, as seen in this 2016 paper, or stem cyclostomes, as seen in this 2023 paper. To repeat the refrain throughout this series, organisms near the split between two clades are going to be extremely similar to each other, making their differentiation difficult. Despite this, conodonts are extremely important to paleontology, not so much for their evolutionary status, but as index fossils. Remember that index fossils are organisms that had a very wide geographic distribution but were only in existence for a relatively short time, often just a few million years. Because of this, researchers can absolutely date the rock layers correlating a particular fossil species with a particular slice of time. Conodonts have very tough tooth-like elements that are useful as index fossils, so they define many slices of time from the Cambrian to the end of the Triassic. For example, the appearance of the conodont Hindiotus parvus marks the period of time known as the Induan Epoch, 251.9 to 251.2 million years ago, the first epoch of the Triassic period. And that brings us, at long last, to Cyclostomata, the extant jawless fish, i.e. lampreys and hagfish, and their extinct relatives. Our common ancestor with them lived about 525 million years ago in the early Cambrian. Modern lampreys and hagfish have sinuous, eel-like bodies with no pectoral or pelvic fins and no biomineralized dermal exoskeleton or endoskeleton. This was not always the case, though. Stem cyclostomes like Lysanius and Euphanerops have more fish-shaped bodies, whether they had any paired fins is debated, uh, with a partially mineralized endoskeleton like that of nathostomes and a heterocircle tail. Therefore, the non-biomineralized, eel-like body of modern cyclostomes is a derived condition, not an ncestral one. Remember from the coelacanth's tale that we must resist the urge to assume that a modern animal has an overall primitive body shape just because it has one or a few ancestral characteristics. One interesting organ all extant vertebrates have is the pineal gland that sits in the midline of the brain, and in most vertebrates the pineal gland is associated with a photoreceptive structure called the parietal eye. The parietal eye typically sits in the middle of the head, just behind the eyes. Across vertebrates, the pineal gland is responsible for the rhythmic production of melatonin, which regulates our sleep cycle. Fish, amphibians, lizards, and snakes have this parietal eye, but it was independently lost prior to the ancestor of crocodiles and birds, as well as in the ancestors of mammals. Instead of light directly stimulating the action of the pineal gland for archosaurs and mammals, the sympathetic nervous system, which regulates your uncontrolled physiological processes like digestion, heart rate, and blood pressure, controls the production of melatonin. Importantly, normal eye and parietal eye photoreceptors share a common evolutionary origin as indicated by their shared proteins, such as opsin and transducin, and genes. Together, these allow us to conclude that pineal photoreceptors are derived from ciliary photoreceptors 
just like the rods and cones of normal eyes. In addition, the projection neuron that connects the pineal photoreceptors to the pineal gland is derived from a rhabdomeric photoreceptor, just like the amacrine and retinal ganglion cells of normal eyes. For a refresher on how phototransduction works, see our video, The Howler Monkey's Tale. The cells of the pineal gland too, called pinealocytes, are also derived from ciliary photoreceptors. So, what of the living cyclostomes? First, hagfish are deep-sea cyclostomes that have highly reduced vertebrae and eyes. There's been much debate as to whether these characteristics are ancestral or derived, but with the inclusion of lampreys and hagfish in one clade, they must be derived. Hagfish scavenge dead organisms that have drifted to the sea floor. Bizarrely, the hagfish can give off a thick, slimy mucus to deter predators, and will even tie itself rapidly in knots to eject the slime. Hagfish are direct developers, contrasting against the other extant clade of jawless fish, the lampreys. Lampreys start life as tiny larvae called amocetes, who filter feed. Upon metamorphosis to the adult form, most lampreys switch to parasitizing fish, either by cutting off chunks of meat or by drinking blood. The exception is caspiomycin, which eats carrion. Lampreys are able to adhere to prey with their circular mouth full of keratin teeth, but this structure didn't evolve until the Mesozoic. Paleozoic lampreys lack the teeth and amicete larvae of modern species, which may explain why Paleozoic forms, like Priscomycin, were so much smaller than modern ones. But a critical event occurred during the Jurassic. Ray-finned fish evolved lightweight scales that allowed for more maneuverability, the cycloid scales. Whereas fish previously had either dermal denticles or ganoid scales, cycloid scales opened up a niche for parasitic animals to exploit. Thus, we see the origin of lamprey teeth shortly thereafter, the development of an evolutionary arms race between ray-finned fish and lampreys. Last year, in 2023, there was a recently described genus, Yan Lao Mizen, from the Jurassic, which were predatory and had very large keratin teeth that almost functioned like an upper and lower jaw. Thus far, all the evolutionary accounts we've given haven't involved the wholesale creation of something new where nothing previously existed. Teeth derived from scales, the jaw derived from nathal plates, ears derived from spiracles, and our inner ear bones derived from skull and jaw bones. As I know we've said many times before, although it never hurts to repeat, evolution necessarily involves repurposing existing structures for new functions. Evolution cannot work with what does not exist. The lamprey's tail is further evidence of that. Genes and even whole genomes can be duplicated. We've discussed this subject many times. In Richard Lenski's long-term Escherichia coli experiment, the bacteria duplicated a segment of several genes that allowed them to metabolize citrate in an aerobic environment, a novel phenotype. Another favorite of mine was when the slough crawfish, Procambarus phallax, duplicated its whole genome in the 1990s to produce the marbled crawfish, Procambarus virginalis. These two species are wholly unable to interbreed. In the evolution of vertebrates, a whole genome duplication occurred prior to the split between cyclostomes and nathostomes. This event was an example of autopolyploidy. In other words, the individual arose as the result of one accidentally diploid gamete fusing with a haploid gamete, as is the case for the marbled crawfish. Then, before the split between chondrichthyes and osteichthyes, Another whole genome duplication occurred, but this was the result of allopolyploidy. For allopolyploidy, the situation is largely the same, except the offspring results from a hybridization between two species. That means two stem nathostomes hybridized in the distant past, and their chromosomes failed to segregate, and we got some extra chromosomes because of it. This is significant for us. You see, most animals have what are called Hox genes organized in Hox clusters. 
These genes are involved in organizing the segments of animals along the anterior to posterior axis of the body. As the result of these whole genome duplication events, jawed vertebrates inherited four Hox clusters. This duplication allowed for the duplicate genes to specialize into new functions. For example, some genes of two of the four Hox clusters, cluster A and D, are involved in the development of vertebrate limbs from the fins of fish to arms and legs. But there is more. A recent study published in Nature last January on the hagfish genome further corroborated the aforementioned genome duplication events. Both the autopolyploidization event in the common ancestor of all vertebrates and the allopolyploidization event in the common ancestor to all jawed vertebrates. However, it turns out that a common ancestor unique to the hagfish and lampreys also experienced a hexaploidization, meaning their genome triplicated. First, there was one whole genome duplication to produce a tetraploid, and that tetraploid hybridized with a diploid, undergoing allopolyploidization, resulting in hexaploid offspring. The lamprey's tale, then, is about gene duplications, and one more gene family can be mentioned. Globins. Globins are found across all three domains of life. In us vertebrates, one of the most important is called hemoglobin, which facilitates the movement of oxygen throughout the body via red blood cells. Hemoglobin is a composite of four globin chains carrying several iron-containing heme molecules. The four chains are two alpha globin and two beta globin chains. As it happens, the genes for both alpha and beta globins arose through duplication and diversification. In humans, these globins are each a cluster of slightly different versions of a gene. For the alpha globin, there are seven. Two versions are non-functional pseudogenes. One version seems functional but never used. Two versions are only functional in embryos, and the last two are used in adult hemoglobin. As for beta globin, there are six. Four versions are expressed only in embryos, one is the adult beta globin, and one is a pseudogene. By being duplicated, each newly minted gene version is able to accrue mutations or be transposed to another chromosome or be duplicated again. As these duplicates travel down separate evolutionary routes, they can give rise to new functions or even new biological structures. For example, hemoglobin is related to proteins called myoglobin and cytoglobin. Myoglobin is found in skeletal muscle tissue and facilitates the diffusion of oxygen to mitochondria. There is only one gene for myoglobin. As for cytoglobin, in mammals, this protein is found in pretty much all tissues and appears to protect against hypoxia. The common ancestor gene of alpha and beta globin existed between 460 and 525 million years ago, while the common ancestor gene of myoglobin and cytoglobin existed between 525 and 535 million years ago. Such broad dates are given because we must necessarily work with living specimens. Fossils this old don't allow us to look at an organism's genes. Fascinatingly, cyclostomes don't make their hemoglobin analog with hemoglobin. Instead, they make theirs with a cytoglobin derivative. Cytoglobin doesn't transport oxygen in nathostomes, but it has been co-opted to transport oxygen in lampreys and hagfish. And we can continue going backwards. Sister to alpha and beta globin, myoglobin and cytoglobin, is neuroglobin. This protein is expressed in the vertebrate brain and retina to protect against hypoxia. We could keep going, but I think you get the point. Genes can be duplicated and diverge in sequence across lineages, giving rise to new protein functions and structures. So, thanks for watching. And we'll see you all next time.